Welcome back! My name is Alex Romanov, this is Art of Impossible, and this is my third video on urnates. So if you have not seen the previous two videos, do it first. The links are in the description below. At the end of this video, I will announce the winner of our little creative competition that I talked about in my previous episode, and the winner will get this nice urnates deck of cards. It looks like a book. In my last video, I talked about a wonderful theory by David Alexander, according to which Wilbur Edgerton Sanders, a mining engineer from a prominent family with a secret passion for gambling, wrote and published The Expert at the Card Table under the pseudonym Erdnays and hid his identity in the pages of the book. Last week, I talked to Richard Hatch who knew David Alexander personally and also knew Martin Gardner, who created the theory explained in my first video, and basically knew everybody involved in Erdnay's hunt, and who has himself developed several theories about Erdnay's. Saying, meet Erdnay's, this is Erdnay's. Bingo, James is the guy, case closed, got our man. And that made me excited, because I thought, I found the guy, gotta be the guy. Well, it's not the guy. In retrospect, how could I, how could I miss that? And it was like, whoa. This was an exciting conversation that lasted two and a half hours. I had to shorten it quite a bit to fit into the format of this channel, and I'm happy to share it with you. Richard Hatch is a professional magician. He holds two graduate degrees in physics from Yale University, he is a member of the International Brotherhood of Magicians, and is a lifetime member of the Society of American Magicians. He is a prominent magic historian and, among many other things, one of the most renowned specialists on Erdnays. It is a real pleasure to listen to someone who is so passionate about magic and its history, and of course, who knows so much about Erdnays. So please, enjoy! We started with talking about Richard's first encounter with the expert at the card table. And this was pretty exciting, because he did not just get a copy of the book, he got the original edition. It was not a formative book in my study of magic. So some people, like, like Vernon, it was his Bible as a kid. He got it, uh, you know, saw it in a store and, and picked it up and, and studied it uh, and memorized it, essentially. Um, and that was not my experience. Uh, at some point, I probably probably got interested in the history part, but not as a skeptic, uh, but I got um, Bart Whaley and Jeff Busby and Martin Gardner's book, The Man Who Was Erdnace. And uh, I read it uncritically uh, and thought it was fascinating, a uh, great story and a lot of uh, information, and but didn't didn't consider that that might not be the true story. Uh, that changed many years later. So that was the, I got that book when I was living in, in Connecticut, still in my graduate study phase, or, or shortly after that, when I shifted gears. And uh, now I'm living in, in Houston, uh, Texas. And at some point, a friend and I started a magic book business, uh, Charlie Randall. Uh, it was H&R Magic Books, which started out by buying used book collections and reselling those. And then we started selling new books and then we started publishing books. So I was in, involved in magic book business. And at some point uh, I had a phone conversation with uh, David Alexander, who I hadn't met in person at that time uh, and knew only from very interesting conversations, fascinating guy. And in one of those phone calls, he said that he knew who who Erdnays really was, and it wasn't who everybody thought it was. So he kind of teased me. He wouldn't tell me, but uh, uh, he threw out some information, things like, uh, well, it's, it's hiding in plain sight. Uh, you know, you're not seeing the forest for the trees. So that kind of started me, that got me curious. Um, but the real big impulse to, to do more was when uh, I walked to the mailbox one day uh, to check the mail, as I do every day, and there was a package from Martin Gardner. Now, Martin Gardner was one of my heroes growing up, and uh, we had developed a relationship as booksellers with him because he would occasionally have things in his library that he wanted to get rid of, and he would send them to us to sell on consignment. Um, and so that's what this was, and I opened it up, and I recognized it was something I'd never seen before. It was a first edition of uh, the expert at the card table. So the original published by the author in 1902. And I knew from Busby's book that the book was quite rare and quite valuable. Uh, we looked up, you know, auction records. I think the Neil C auction at Swans had a, a, at that time, the most recent copy and it sold for 
you know, probably between one and $2,000, which oh. seemed like a lot of money for a book that's, you know, been reprinted many, many times. So uh, we called Martin Gardner and we said, you know, we, we think that the way to realize the fair market value would be to put it on eBay and let mm -hmm. the market decide. And he was intrigued by that. And he said, you know, I could make the auction more interesting by sending you my my research files. And we thought, sure, that'd be great. In going through his research files, um, I saw things that are mentioned in Ex The Man Who Was Erdnace, the Busby Whaley Gardner book, but that I saw in a different context, in particular, the correspondence between Martin Gardner and Marshall Smith. So at that time, the only theory was that Milton Franklin Andrews was Erdnace. So what was strange? about the theory. In the book, they mentioned the fact that Smith was not comfortable with the height discrepancy, that the man he recalled meeting in Gardner's notes from the very first meeting was a fairly short man, whereas uh, Milton Franklin Andrews, the proposed author that Martin Gardner finally settled on, Milton Franklin Andrews, was six foot one and a half in his stocking feet. And in these letters, uh, Marshall uh, Smith just says, I, you know, I, I didn't meet that guy. That's I, I even, you know, this, this much later, my memory can't be wrong on that point. I was, I definitely remember I was looking down on him. In other words, he was shorter than I am. Uh, if it would have been this other guy, I would have been looking up to him. So I'm thinking, okay, you know, maybe it's worth looking at again. And I'm thinking, well, you know, I'm, I'm as smart as David Alexander. If he can find him, I can find him. So Richards found another candidate whose name was James DeWitt Andrews. At the end of the 90s, when he started his research, internet was already there, so he used its power to discover a very interesting fact, and he even showed me exactly how this happened. The obvious first thing that, that uh, wasn't obvious at the time the book came out, but became clear to people, is that if you read the name S.W. Erdnase backwards, it creates a plausible real name, E.S. Andrews. Couldn't that be the author's name? So at some point in his research, uh, Martin Gardner decided uh, early on that maybe it was not an E.S. Andrews, maybe the E.S. was the last part of a first name like James. And working with Martin Gardner's theory that maybe it was a James Andrews, because James ends in E.S., so all you have to do is reverse James Andrews and drop the M.A.J. from the reversal and you get E.S. Andrews, or S.W. Erdnays when it's reversed. I found what I thought was a really good candidate. He was an attorney, uh, from Illinois, where all this stuff is happening in Illinois. It's, uh, you know, the book was published in Chicago. Chicago's in eastern Illinois. This gentleman was born in western Illinois, a town called Sterling, Illinois. And, but he went east to go to law school, and then he settled in Chicago. He started his law practice in Chicago in the early 1890s. He stays there until 1903 when he moves to New York. Uh, and that would, the book, as it turns out, dropped it from $2 a copy, right. that's cover price, to $1 in 1903. Well, maybe he had copies he hadn't sold. He didn't want to take them with him on his move to New York. So he's fitting this profile. A lot of his early books are titled on the title page treatises. Uh, at least one of them begins with a definition of terms, like a glossary of legal terms, just like Erdnace has a glossary of, you know, in jog, out jog, blind shuffle, blind cut, uh, that he's going to use in, in, in describing slights. So there were a lot of parallels. Um, and, and to me, reading portions of his other books, uh, I thought I could hear a similar voice. I could kind of hear echoes of the Erdnase voice that made me think, you know, this is, this is the guy. I've got him. Now, one piece of information that um, Marshall Smith gave to Martin Gardner that Gardner thought would crack the case for him, and he pursued it actively as, as best he could at the time, uh, was that in their conversation, um, in Smith's conversation with the author, somehow it came up that the author... Erdnase was somehow related, and related is an ambiguous term, but was somehow related to uh, a man named Louis Dalrymple, who was a, a cartoon, a political cartoonist, a caricaturist for, for newspapers. So uh, I, I decided I've got to find out how is, how is James DeWitt Andrews, uh, my candidate at that time that I was really excited about, uh, how is he related to Dalrymple? So this is uh, the Illinois government puts out this marriage index, which is an index of their, their marriages between these years, 1763 and 1900. They're all digitized, and they're, they're searchable on uh, groom's names and bride's names. So I knew that um, Dalrymple's mother's name was Seely. Let's submit that. There we go. We get two hits here. This one here, uh, 
I said, look, uh, what I was focusing on, it was, it's an Edwin Summer, and sometimes it's Sumner. It's hard to read the handwriting. So I, Summer is a legitimate name, but Sumner is one I'm more familiar with. But he married this Dolly F. Seeley, and to me, what, and it was in 1898, before the book comes out, and to me, the exciting part was it was in Whiteside County, which is where James Andrews was born and raised and started his early legal career before moving to Chicago. So I'm thinking, bingo, James is the guy, because here's his... I don't know how he was related to Edwin Summer, but he's probably a cousin or something, and his cousin married a Seeley, and this Seeley is related to Dalrymple. So we see. So it's first like it was basically the it just confirmed your theory about James. Of James, like, yeah, yes. it's like, okay. it's like okay. another. He, it's fitting the profile better all the time. He's and yes. you know, he's the right age, approximately. I think in 1902 or 1901 when they would have met. I think. Uh, James DeWitt Andrews was 45, and the illustrator remembered someone between 40 and 45. In all the uh, photographs and illustrations I've had of uh, of James DeWitt, he's clean shaven, which is what the man remembered. Anyway, so he's he's fitting all these preconceptions I have for the author. In 1999 in Los Angeles at the Conference on Magic History, Richard presented the arguments against Milton Franklin Andrews and his own candidate, James DeWitt Andrews. At the same conference, David Alexander gave his talk and presented his proposed author, Wilbur Edgerton Sanders. What was it like? So uh, that's kind of where I was when I went to give the LA talk. So I, I right. that how Gardner got to him, the problems with it, the wrong age, the wrong height, no literary skills to write the book, low education. Uh, so we don't think he's the guy. And here's maybe someone, James DeWitt Andrews, who's pretty good, and he might be related to, to Dalrymple through this E.S. Andrews. So that was the end of my presentation. And then we bring on David Alexander, and he gives his. Now, David Alexander was nice enough the night before my presentation. He doesn't know what I'm going to say. I don't know what he's going to say. He came to our hotel room where Charlie and I were staying and gave his presentation to us. And it was like, whoa. That was not on my, you know, because I, I knew enough. I knew that my guy, I knew that James DeWitt Andrews was not his guy. And that made me excited because I thought I found the guy. I don't know who he's found, but my guy's so good. I've got him beat. Um, and he gives his presentation and, uh, about William Edgerton Sanders. And that was not on anybody's radar except for his and his partner, Richard Kyle's. Uh, it's actually a, a, a great theory and an excellent theory and a very smart way of approaching it. It is indeed a very smart theory, and I also have to mention the name of Marty Demarest, who did some incredible research on Wilbur Edgerton Sanders and a lot of facts that I've mentioned in my previous video were discovered by him. But there are a couple of reasons why we can doubt this theory. David Alexander, in talking about how he came to his candidate, talks about, let's read the book. The, all writing is autobiographical. Let's see what we can find out from his book. And you mentioned this in your prior uh, video on W.E. Sanders, that according to, to uh, David Alexander and his, his uh, research partner, that uh, the book is so well written, it implies a college education. That implies that he was from yeah. the North. If you reverse that, it implies that no one from the South went to college for a whole generation. That's ridiculous. <laughs> but statistically, it might make sense. And that's kind of thinking I wouldn't have even thought to do. So it's, uh, I, I give them points for that. But I, I don't think you can take the, he's got to be from the North and the East and those kinds of things. Uh, or be college education, educated. You know, Mark, a lot of our best writers, Mark Twain, didn't go to college. My main reason for not being convinced that it's him is in looking at the other things he's written, none of them jump out at me as sounding like Erdnase. And again, it's like Erdnase has such a, a strong style that you feel when you read it, you're, you're hearing the author's voice when he says things in a, in a particularly memorable way. And so I'm looking for that voice to jump out at me from a possible author's other writings. And there have uh, they've been some sophisticated um, stud analyses of different proposed authors to see if there's a good match with the expert and their other writings. And, uh, and I don't, I don't see it. And, and the studies that I've seen on it have not found a match for Sanders, other writings. And these now, you know, I've discussed with Marty Demarest, although it's been a long time, but my recollection is that, and, and Marty's a professional journalist and a, and a writer. Uh, so has a, uh, and different understanding of this than I probably would, but he says that, look, 
if you're a professional writer, you can write for different audiences. And so his Erdnase voice is going to be different than his mining engineering voice. It's just going to be different than when he's writing poetries for his Columbia class reunion. And so we shouldn't expect him to sound the same when writing in these different voices. Uh, and that's a, a good argument. Um, but I would still like, you know, I, I, I think, the Erdnase voice is the author's real voice. I think he's talking to us and telling us things. And I want to see that. So Will, Will Bredgerton Sanders, he was the son of a prominent statesman uh, and the nephew of the governor of Montana or the senator or all kinds of stuff. He was from a prominent wealthy family that there are reasons why he wouldn't want his family name associated with a book on how to cheat at cards. Um, so he would plausibly want that more, that stronger anonymity. But if you wanted really strong anonymity, you'd put, by Joe Smith, uh, a real name that could be anybody that doesn't have any connection to your name. Why would you put the illustrator's name on the book if he was in fact the illustrator and did in fact meet the, the author? And why would you copyright it? Because anyone could have in 1902 gone to the copyright office, found out that McKinney printed it, gone to McKinney, found out the, you know, the man's name or where he stayed or the, the hotel room uh, that he met. You could have found Marshall Smith from the, you know, title page. And we met in this hotel on this date and the check was written on this bank. And, you know, he'd remember that at that point, the name he called him. So, and then Richards came up with another candidate who was just great. And the funny part is that he already knew about him, but got misdirected. And, you know, this is how, when you're so focused on something, it's like misdirection mag magic. You're, you, you focus on one thing and you miss everything else. I really didn't know much about Edwin Sumner Andrews. Uh, and, and I didn't get excited about the fact that he's an E.S. Andrews, you know, which is in retrospect, how could I, how could I miss that? I mean, it's so obvious, <laughs> uh, but I was so focused on James. James is my guy uh, that, that that was peripheral to my, my vision as it were, as it turned out. So now I'm wanting to connect Edwin Sumner Andrews to James. And the more I find out about Edwin Sumner, the more interesting he becomes. He's uh, in Chicago, I think starting in the late 1880s. Um, and uh, he was born in, in Minnesota, uh, moved to Iowa for a while, then started working on the trains and eventually made his way to Chicago. And he gets transferred from Chicago to Denver. Uh, and I haven't talked about the Denver connection. Jay Marshall, a uh, well-known magician, uh, magic shop owner in Chicago. He's a good friend of Martin Gardner's. And one of the things that uh, J. Marshall writes to him is that he visited an old vaudevillian, a man named Hugh Johnston who's in the hospital and they're making conversation. And because Jay Marshall is interested in this, he throws out, Hey, did you, did you know anything about expert at the card table and the man who wrote it? And Hugh Johnson says, yeah, I was at the beginning of my career, early in my career, I was performing in Denver, Colorado at the Empress theater. And another performer, Della Delphia came backstage after my performance and had a companion with him and he introduced me to this companion saying, meet Erdnase, this is Erdnase. So he claimed that he met the guy. My guy moves to Denver in uh, the 1890s after he transferred from Chicago, he's given a promotion. He goes from being a clerk in the Chicago office for the Chicago Northwestern uh, Railroad to being uh, what's called a traveling agent. Now that's different than a travel agent. He's not selling passengers tickets. He's going out and saying, hey, you wanna ship your cattle to Chicago? here, I can give you the best deal. And he's a troubleshooter. He's manning their office. If anybody has an issue, uh, he's the guy to talk to. And to me, just as the timeline developed, so he's, he's living in uh, Chicago at a time you want him in Chicago, then he moves to Denver, and we have a Denver connection, then he moves back to Chicago just in time to find the illustrator, get the pub book published. And then he gets transferred in 1903, I think in February 1903, his job changes, he's still a traveling agent, but he gets transferred to San Francisco, another center of gambling. If you're a gambler, you want to see a guy in Denver was a big center, San Francisco was a center, Chicago was a center. So he's in all the places where he, if he were a card cheat, which was kind of my loose profile then, and, and was Gardner's as well, you know, these would be good places for him to be. And he has free access to the trains, and a lot of card play on trains to observe and participate in. He can take his pass and go wherever he wants with it. And Bill actually found a reference in a San Francisco newspaper to definitely 
this Edwin Andrews, um, having been invited to a card game uh, by his fellow train people, uh, and he turns it down. He says, I, I can't do it because uh, I got to pick up some pippins, which is a kind of apples. I've got to be... You okay. know, I got to be doing some work. So he, he bows off. He says, I'm not, I'm not going to play. And the, the reason it's in the newspaper is an anecdote is because later that day when he claims that he's, he's working on this Apple project, buying Pippins for shipment, uh, they spot him in, I guess, what is essentially the red light district of San Francisco with a couple of girls on either arm. And they make fun of that in the newspaper saying, oh, now we know what kind of Pippins you're dealing with or something like that. They'll make a little joke of it. The fact that it was, you know, considered the fact that there's that they invited him to play cards would indicate some prior history of card play, which a lot of people play cards. That doesn't prove anything. Doesn't actually put a deck of cards in his hand, but it brings us a step closer. And he eventually becomes a, uh, as a apple orchard, uh, he retires from the railroad and, and in his retirement, you know, raises apples. Um, Anyway, so my guy, uh, Edwin Andrews, uh, he dies in 1928 before the book came up for copyright renewal. In his uh, will, there are some interesting things that just kind of jump out as being kind of strange where they say Edwin S. Andrews, also known as and called E.S. Andrews, blah, blah, blah. It says that several times in a very formalistic way. So it's clear that he must have had something of value under the name E.S. Andrews like maybe a copyright uh, that he was maybe getting royalties from Drake, who was at that time the publisher of the book. But do we know anything about his height? In fact, we do, and Richard shared with me a great example of his detective process. The question is, is he the right height? Well, the one photograph I was able to get from the widow of his grandson <laughs> that I tracked down um, shows him with his wife and his two then teenage children. It's in, in his San Francisco period. Um, and he's, he's not as tall as his children or his wife. That doesn't mean he's five foot six or whatever you want him to be, but you know, he's not, he's not a towering beanpole. And at one point I said, well, let's, let's assume that the shingles behind him or the bricks, whatever, they're, that they're standard brick size and multiply out. And boy, sure enough, you get, he's right the size you want him to be. Well, that's, you know, kind of fudging the, uh, the facts to fit what you want, but he, he appears to be plausibly short. Uh, we have one uh, photograph of Marshall Smith standing up uh, between uh, Paul Rosini, well-known performer at the time, and Martin Gardner. And uh, Smith is actually taller than Martin Gardner. And at one point I knew Martin Gardner's height. Uh, he was not short, but he was, maybe he was five foot eight. So Smith is, is taller than that. And, and, but he says, I would have been looking up to a six foot one person. I was definitely looking down on this guy. Uh, so my guy appears to be plausibly the right, the right height range. So Edwin Sumner Andrews could well be Urbnace. But are there reasons to doubt this theory? That is a major failing of my candidate is we don't have other published uh, or, or really unpublished. I got from it, the, again, uh, widow of his grandson that I was in contact with at the time, um, a letter that he'd written to his grandson. Uh, you know, so he's writing to a baby and it's handwritten. Um, and it's just a, a paragraph, you know, welcoming him to the family or something like that, or looking forward to seeing him, something like that. It's not enough to make a, a That's judgment. That's the only piece comparison. of writing which we have from, from uh, the only one I've seen. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and his background has no higher education. It's not even clear if he graduated from high school. He starts working on the trains, uh, you know, as a newsboy, you know, selling sandwiches and newspapers up and down the aisles uh, when he's a teenager in Iowa and then works his way up the ranks. Um, and so there's no evidence of a higher education. But again, you know, he could be self-educated. And the woman, Dolly Seeley, that he married, um, was quite impressive. She, you know, was a working woman at a time when most women weren't working. She worked as a stenographer for like the National Pipe Company in Chicago. Then she had her own stenography company. And so she had training uh, as a stenographer, which is post high school education. And, uh, you know, we tend to, again, it's not a hard and fast rule, but we tend to be attracted to partners who have similar intellectual interests and abilities as we do so that you know, it, it, there's a theory that I kind of like that he, you know, he dictated the book to his wife. <laughs> you know, she's a stenographer. <laughs> she, she cleaned up his prose. So we have many candidates. In my videos so far, we have already talked about four, and there are actually many more. 
So which one is the best? Uh, sometimes I'm asked, you know, do you think one of the current proposed authors is him? I'd have to be kind of like Martin Gardner. I'd say probably of the proposed candidates that I'm familiar with, and I like them all, and, and I've uh, looked at them all and studied them all, and I'm looking forward to, Todd Carr's got a book coming out that I'm really excited to find out what he's, his thoughts are. I think they're all really interesting stories and interesting people and interesting theories. Um, but if I had to bet on any one of them, I'd say probably, probably the chances are greater than 50% that none of them wrote the book, that we don't have any idea who wrote it. It's still some unknown person out there waiting to be discovered or never to be discovered, which I'm fine with either case. And I think the, you know, the, the chase is, is more interesting maybe than the end goal. Because once you discover them, it's kind of like, well, you can chip away at finding out more about that person, fill in some biographical gaps, but you got to find another hobby then. <laughs> so we still do not know. But why? Is it because Ernest really wanted to never be found? I think it's an accident of history that we don't know who he is. I don't think it's because right. he wanted that absolute anonymity because he put the illustrator's name on it, he put copyrighted it. For some reason, no one was interested at the time. And by the time they got interested, it was too late. At the end of our conversation, we came back to the question with which I started my first video on Ernest. Why is the question of the author's identity important? So I don't think it's important and I don't think it's going to change much when we find out, but I think it's very interesting and it's fun. I did uh, the, when we were, uh, had sold the Martin Gardner's stuff, including the first edition when that sold on um, eBay, uh, which I think was in February of 2000. Then that was followed up the Wall Street Journal, which is America's most prominent business uh, based uh, news yeah. source. Uh, they did a, a front page story on, on Erdnace and the hunt for him. And uh, the, wow. the uh, uh, author of the story, Rachel Silverman, wanted me to give her a, a, a quote that she could use. And so I'm thinking about it, I was inspired by, you know, Vernon and some others refer to this as the, the card man's Bible. And so I, the quote I gave her, which she did end up using was something like, uh, uh, for, uh, devotees of the expert at the card table of devotees of the book to not know who wrote it would be like, uh, devout Christians, not knowing who wrote the new Testament gospels. So that's why, you know, we want to know it doesn't, you know, knowing that this one is by Matthew, which is probably disputed among biblical scholars, but it doesn't, it's not going to change your, your faith, but it's, it helps you put it in a different context. And to wrap up, we also talked about the importance of studying magic history. And what Richard said was truly inspirational. I enjoy learning about the history. I think it's fascinating. And I think it gives a, a different uh, perspective to, I like to tell my audiences about the history too, of the things I perform. And when I, I my wife is a violinist and we occasionally perform with our son, uh, Jonathan, who's a pianist. And in those performances, we'll have a program printed and I'll, I'll identify this as, you know, like on a program of music. So this piece is by Bartok and this magical piece is Robert Dan's or Hofzinser's and, you know, I let the audience know. So I'm not claiming I didn't invent all this stuff. And, and it's also inspirational. Uh, I don't think finding out who Erdnace was is going to make me a better card magician, but I do think studying the history of magic, when you see how other generations have solved their technical problems or created, you know, certainly for presentational things, they have uh, uh, great plots and great ideas. And so I think the history is important to study, not just to acknowledge where it came from and, and it's not created in a vacuum, but to inspire your own performances. And it gives a certain texture to them. And I think audiences intuitively, even if you don't address it overtly and talk about it, which I do enjoy doing, but you don't have to. I think they sense that you, there's more to what they're seeing than what they see in, in, a, right. in a positive way. So I, I think that's good. And so with this, I finish my series on Erdnase. But the story of Erdnase Hunt does not end here. New facts are being discovered, new books with new theories are being published. So maybe this short introduction to this topic will inspire some of you to start your own research. And who knows, maybe one day we will know who Erdnase was. And actually, I have seen some new cool theories in the comment section under my previous video. Last time I asked you to suggest your candidate, and now it is time to choose the winner of our little creative competition. Thanks everyone for submitting your versions. I was really impressed with your creativity. 
Frank Coach claims that he is the reincarnation of Erdnase. NHL Magic argues that I am Erdnase. Well, actually, my hands do look like the hands in these illustrations. They also have five fingers. I am Erdnase. Several people believe that Daniel Madison, the famous deception artist and a time traveler, is Erdnase. Well, considering that Madison said, I'm better than Erdnase, and then isolated himself for a year to study the book, it is a very valid theory. Because maybe instead of studying Erdnase for a year, he actually wrote the book, and then traveled back in time to publish it, and then returned and published his book about Erdnase. Another version was that Shin Lim is the author and also a time traveler. Sounds fair, especially considering the fact that Erdnase argued that a true master should never show off his skills. But on the other hand, who knows, maybe Shin Lim is indeed a time traveler, but he was the illustrator of the book. And when he traveled back in time, he met Daniel Madison, the actual author, in a cold hotel room and created the famous illustrations. Whoa! I have to make a video about this. Anyway, time to choose, and I really liked one theory that suggested someone not from the magic community. Erdnase was Tolkien, the author of The Lord of the Rings. Here is why. You correctly said that Erdnase in German is Earth Knows. And Erdnase wrote that he wrote the book because he needed the money. And who lives inside the Earth digging for gold? Money. Dwarves. Who wrote the most famous story with dwarves? Tolkien. So Tolkien, at the age of 10, used his experience at the school card tables to write his first books. Do we need more arguments? Tolkien has seven letters. Now count the letters in Erdnase. Boom! Case closed. Bravo, Detective uh, Dr. Dre. Please send me a message to romanovmagic at gmail.com and put Erdnase in the subject line so I can contact you and get this deck delivered to you maybe even before Christmas. If you are not Dr. Dre, do not try to cheat. But you can still send me an email if you want to see some other parts of the interview with Richard that were not included in this video. Thank you again for your feedback, for watching my videos and for supporting this channel. My name is Alex Romanov, this was Art of Impossible, I will see you next time.